Churches. Um, we're experiencing terrible wildfires in the state. And UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, is active in that. Um, related to that, the Albuquerque District churches are collecting hygiene kits uh, to send to northern New Mexico. We will collect them here through May 12th. And for about 12 bucks, you can, uh, you can put together a hygiene kit or you can bring some of the supplies along. Those lists will, are available on the back table of what you can bring if you want to make a hygiene kit. Sylvia Barlow was also kind enough to make a couple example hygiene kits so you can see what they look like in their final form. And we do encourage you to participate in that between now and, May, and June 12th. With that, those are my announcements. And so I want to invite Tom back up to open us in prayer. And will you bow your heads as we pray? Gracious God, we welcome you today, trusting in your goodness and that your ways, your life, and your call can change and deepen our lives. In our time together today, move us closer to you and further from our selfish egos. We welcome you into our lives today. Amen. All right, it's time for the children's moment, and so I want to invite the kids to come forward. You can come sit right over there. Good morning. Great to see all of you here today. It's summertime. It's a good time. You're going swimming. Just, just for the record, two seconds flat, and the children's sermon is out of control. So that's about right for me. Cool. Hey, let me show you a picture, okay? What do you think this is a picture of? Any ideas? A planet? You got it right. It's the planet Earth, right? Anybody? Yeah, it's our planet, isn't it? And it's, yeah. I do like your shirt. Your shirt is from planet Earth, too, and it's got space on it. It's thematic. In fact, Tristan, why don't you stand right here in front of me for a moment? And that way we can... No, turn around. Turn around. You got a nice shirt, too. See, now we've got a spaceman floating around um, Earth. That's pretty cool. I didn't even plan that part. So um, here's why I'm showing you this. Anybody know where we live on this planet? Anybody think you could point out where we live? Oh, man, that's Africa. That's a beautiful place. Where else? Where do you think we might live? I think the Oh, that's Australia. That's a good one, too. I think the Yeah? Let me tell you. I think the Right now, that's right. You, you got it right. We do not live. Where do you think, Mackenzie? Last guess. We live over here. Okay, let me show you. Go ahead and have a seat. Right now, as we sit here in this church... We are right here over to the left, okay? That's North America, and that's where we live. And the thing is, everybody you know, everybody any of us have ever known, have lived somewhere on this ball, okay? I mean, not literally, but somewhere on, on Earth, right? Now, let me ask you something. We, like I said, we live right here in North America, in New Mexico. Do you think God loves people in North America? I think so. What about the people who live over here in Africa? Think God loves them? I have a feeling they do, that God does. What about the people, maybe people down here at the bottom at some research station in Antarctica. Do you think that God loves those people? I know this is where the church is. Right now. Okay. See, all over the world, there are all kinds of places. There are deserts and mountains and jungles and forests, lots of water, more water than land, huh? Yeah, hiking is a good way to see all of God's earth. And I go to the with me. Yeah, but no matter where you go, you're going to bump into people that God loves. And so it's our job to love them too. Cool. And now that we know that the children's sermon was about swimming, um, let's say a short prayer. And I'm going to let you go to Sunday school, okay? To children's church. Yeah. Okay, let's say a prayer, okay? Can you bow your heads? Dear God, thank you for the earth. Thank you for all the neat places in it. 
Thank you for all of the people who are here. And thank you for making us all so different. We love you. Amen. All right, time for children's church. That's okay. I think she was praying in her heart. All right, as the children head to children's church, let's stand for the affirmation of faith. We believe in one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, the life of a love and prayer, in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as a sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship. We believe in the reign of God, as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Doug? Uh, in just a moment, we'll sing a couple of songs, and as we do, we'll prepare for a time of prayer. You can do that in one of several ways. If you have a joy or a concern which you wish to lift up uh, today, you can write it on one of the white cards in the backs of your chairs. And just raise your hand and someone will collect those cards, or you can bring them to me directly, or you can also leave them here on the altar if that's more meaningful to you. You also can come to the candle box, and if you'd like to share a joy or a concern in that way, you are very welcome to do so. Just uh, take one of the candles from the basket and light it from the center flame and leave it there as a sign of hope or trust in God in, in any situation. And finally, uh, we are nearly done collecting offering contactlessly, but we do have to train our ushers in June to, to pass plates, because that's very complicated, as you know, uh, to hand a plate to people. But um, in the meantime, we are, we are still collecting our offering contactlessly. And so if you brought an offering today, we're very grateful for your generosity, and you are invited as we sing these songs to come and place it in the offering plate. All those things we will do as uh, the band leads us in um, the next couple of praise songs. And we want, we, yet last week was supposed to be his first Sunday, but we want to officially welcome Saul to the praise band who's joining us playing bass. And we're glad that the electricity is on and running today so we can hear your talent as well. Let's all stand and sing together. Will I believe you when you say Your hand will guide my every way Will I receive the word you say Every moment of every day Well, I will walk by faith even when I cannot see Because this broken road Prepares your will for me Help me to rid my endless fears You've been so helpful for all my years With one breath you make me new your grace covers all I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will 
walk by faith when even when I cannot see because this broken road prepares your will for me well I'm broken, broken but I still see your faith well you Well, I will walk by faith, even when I cannot see, because this broken road prepares your will for me. Well, I will walk by faith, when even when I cannot see, because Prepares your will for me. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, hallelujah, This is one of our newer ones. It's new for us anyway, but it's been such a pleasure to learn new songs and new music to bring to you all. If you ever have that one song that you're just passionate about, bring it up to us. We might be able to learn it for you. So we encourage you to do that. Days I lose the fight, try my best, but just don't get it right. Where I talk a talk that I don't walk, and miss the moments right before my eyes. Somebody with the hurt that I could have helped Somebody with a hand that I could have held When I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be a little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith A little more like patience A little more like peace A little more like Jesus a little less like me Yeah, there's no denying I have changed I've been saved from who I used to be But even at my best, I must confess I still need help to see the way you see Somebody with a hook that I could have helped Somebody with a hand that I could have helped When I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be A little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness Goodness and love and faith A little more like patience A little more like peace A little more like Jesus Love to be on hands and feet, freely give 
baby. Oh. seated and as you are we do have a few joys and concerns to share with you today uh, first and foremost uh, from Ann Park Hill or not foremost but first uh, from Ann Park Hill um, for her friend Charlene who has COVID and that's caused her to postpone some cancer treatments we lift her up today um, also from Mary uh, for my mom Patricia who fell this morning at her assisted living home for uh, Tina's son David healing uh, from surgery for him and uh, continued healing for Diane, who I'm sure is watching. And just know, Diane, we are praying for you for all these things. And anything that's on your heart, uh, let's go into God's presence and into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to live in love and charity with others. And as we ask for your forgiveness, enable us to be forgiving. Take from our lives the hidden grudges, any concealed hate. Forgive us that we have so often denied you, that like lost sheep we've turned away from you, that we've sung with our lips what we have not had the courage to practice in our lives. Forgive our sins, comfort our sorrows, calm our fears, and take from us every proud thought. And in their place, Lord, Fill us with love, concern for others, and make us ready to help and quick to forgive. We thank you for every good thing in our lives, for home, for friends, for family, for all the beauty and loveliness in this world around us, which has lifted our hearts and made us glad, for life itself with all its promise and possibility. And we thank you that in every great experience of life, when it seemed as if we were passing through water or fire or anything else, we were not alone and we are not alone. You are there as a companion and a friend. We thank you that we are yours, created for your glory, that you have called us all by name, and that through Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, who lived and died and rose again for us, you have redeemed us. We believe that your love will never finally let us go or ultimately give us up. We thank you that so often you have come to us in the ordinary and the everyday things of life, in our work and our leisure. Help us there to seek you and find you and serve you, as in Christ you have sought and found and served us. And we ask all these things for Jesus' sake and in his name as we pray in the manner that he taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily prayer and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Judges 18, verses 1 through 10, is our first scripture reading today and should make us ask questions. The Israelites are living next to a peaceful people, and the Israelites want their land. God seems to give permission. The neighbors of the Israelites, the text says, are peaceful. Why do you think God would bless their slaughter in scripture? 
In those days, Israel had no king. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites were se was seeking a place of their own where they might settle, because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. So the Danites sent five of their leading men from Zorah and Eshtael to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all the Danites. They told them, go, explore the land. So it, they entered the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah, where they spent the night. When they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. So they turned in there and asked him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them what Micah had done for him and said, He has hired me and I am his priest. Then they said to him, Please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. The priest answered them, Go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. So the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw what that the people were living in safety, like the uh, Sidonians, at peace and secure. And since their land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relationship with anyone else. When they returned to Zorah and Eshtael, their fellow Danites asked them, How did you find things? They answered, Come on, let us attack them. We have seen the land and it is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate to go there and take it over. When you get there, you will find an unsuspecting people and a spacious land that God has put into our hands, a land that lacks nothing whatsoever. Psalm 145 is our second scripture reading and speaks of God's greatness. Yet it also tells us that God is great, in part because God is good. Without God's goodness, God would be less great. I will exalt you, my king, the God. I will, I'm sorry. I will exalt you, my God, the king. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all the people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed to him down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them your food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and saves them.
The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praises of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. God says it, I believe it, but does that settle it? This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, first of all, I feel like we owe a, a little bit of applause to Tom, who waded through some names. Uh, it's been a while since I opened the Bible to Ishtael and those crazy Danites, and so uh, good, good work with that. Um, as we start off today, we've been in this series of things that we attribute to God, but very often God never said those things. And to start off today, I want to take you to Cleveland in 1986 and uh, to a group of kids who had been awake all night, and the grown-ups wanted it that way. In fact, they brought in a rock and roll DJ to keep them up and pumped, and it was Cleveland in 1986, who so was a good DJ um, and a good rock and roll DJ, DJ keeping the kids uh, up and doing their part, and the grown-ups did their part as well, planning, getting the police and the city to sign off on closures and overtime and regulations. Uh, they alerted the Federal Aviation Administration and commandeered a quarter block of downtown Cleveland at the foot of Terminal Tower, uh, this skyscraper that for years had been the tallest building out that in the world outside of New York City, was built back in the 20s when Cleveland was the fifth largest city in America and a thriving metropolis, a hub of the oil industry, uh, a, one of the hubs of this brand new auto industry. And it, this tower was a symbol of a city on the rise. And uh, that was back before that city had stopped rising. That was a long time before. And a lot of the industry had moved out by 1986. And that which remained was, it was well known, was poisoning the town. In fact, you know what Cleveland was best known for in the 50s and 60s and 70s? It's river catching on fire because there were so many pollutants in it. The worst one was in 1969. And by that point, it had turned Cleveland into something of a national joke. By 1980, Cleveland wasn't the fifth largest city in America anymore. It was the 18th largest city in America. And one man who had just become head of the United Way of Northeast Ohio, one of the state's largest charities, he had an idea that would bring Cleveland back and, and put it back on the map, turn everything around. All he needed was a major event that would raise money but also lift the spirits of this city that he loved so much. He wanted to send a clear message that Cleveland was done being the mistake on the lake. And it was time to show the world that Cleveland was on the rise. And what better to do that than a balloon or a lot of balloons? It was a good metaphor. Now, the previous year, in 1985, Disneyland had celebrated its 30th anniversary by releasing 1.2 million helium balloons out over the city of Anaheim. They would do better. Not just one better or two better. They would do 800,000 better. They would release 2 million balloons out over Cleveland. And so they got to work tracking down helium, building a three-story scaffolding to hold uh, all of the balloons, a network of copper tubing that allowed 2,500 volunteers to fill the helium balloons um, all together. They got 25 of those, like I said, 2,500 volunteers and got them to work one Friday night on September 26, 1986. All the volunteers were high school kids. Sorry, band people, but they were band kids because they figured band people might not be busy on a Friday night. And so, um, sorry, not my, not my wisdom there, but, but, um, but that's, that's what they did. Uh, and by morning, the numbers of balloons were growing. First a half million, then they were up to 800,000. Pretty soon they topped a million, and as the sun came up, they realized the weather forecast was not going to work in their favor. And so they hurried up and tried to fill the balloons, uh, got up to 1,400,000 and change worth of balloons. And as thunderstorms were forecast and were finally rolling in, they decided we're not going to make it to 2 million, but we've already beat the record by 200,000 balloons. 
why not just with great fanfare do what we were going to do? And so at 1.50 p.m., with just shy of a million and a half balloons floated out um, and ready to go, they released them and they emerged over what is today the 53rd largest city in America. And on that afternoon, it must have felt like things were looking up. The volunteers marveled at what they had pulled off. There was this, as you can see, this great roiling cloud of balloons billowing out over the city even as it began to rain. All the balloons, red, yellow, green, purple, they all meshed together into this rusty orange haze, like some nuclear age blob descending on Godzilla's Tokyo. Now, if you're all familiar with physics, as I'm sure you are, you all know that when 1.5 million things go up, they must do what? They will come down. And being familiar with the city of Cleveland, as you may be, you may have already guessed that this is where their plan went a little bit askew. Uh, so when balloon metaphors for civic renewal do come down, all that's left to do is pick up the pieces. 1.5 million pieces. Now they did order biodegradable balloons, but hundreds of thousands of deflated balloons just turned up everywhere, washing up on the shores of Lake Erie, not just in Cleveland, but as far away as Toronto. There was um, stories of untold numbers of fish and birds who ate and then choked on the balloons themselves. There was an Arabian horse, a prize-winning Arabian horse, three counties over, that saw a wave of balloons coming over the horizon and it panicked and it ran around until it tripped and hurt itself and United Way had to settle that lawsuit for about 100 grand. There were drivers who were out on the freeway when a blizzard of balloons blew across the freeway and the traffic accidents were unbelievable. There was the Pittsburgh airport which had to close for the day while they pulled balloons off of the runway. And probably most tra tragic of all, there were the two fishermen in Lake Erie whose boat capsized and they radioed for help and the Coast Guard went to find them and, and re rescue them looking for brightly colored life jackets of the people in the lake. And of course, everything was brightly colored because there were balloons everywhere and those two people didn't make it. Guinness Work Book of World Records certified Balloon Fest 86 is the largest helium balloon release ever at one million, the official count was 1,429,643 balloons. And it's a record that likely will never be broken and can we all just agree that maybe it's a record that shouldn't ever be broken. Don't come to me with Mesa View Balloon Fest 23 or something. Uh, we probably won't do it. Sometimes our very best ideas go astray. Sometimes those things that we are absolutely sure of end up being a little bit questionable don't they? I mean, that's true when it came to Balloon Fest 86. The promoters of the event were just sure that it was the thing that was going to turn around Cleveland just by sheer force of publicity and, and, and positive thinking and, and promotion. But, you know, all of us sooner or later, we're promoters too. I think of a bumper sticker I still see from time to time. Has anyone ever seen that bumper sticker on a car in front of them in traffic or something? God said it. That settles it. And of course, there's a third part usually. I, or God said it, I believe it. That settles it. And as I said, in this series, we've been looking at all kinds of things that, that God never said, and yet we act like he did. And this one, which is nowhere in Scripture, this is the one out of all of them that I can kind of appreciate. I have no appreciate. Uh, appreciation for God won't give you anything you can't handle. I have no appreciation for a lot of the other things, but I can appreciate the aspiration of saying, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. The Lord is king. God is supreme. I do believe that. I believe God's word is the best thing we can order our lives around. And yet, when we read stories like that one in, in the book of Judges, it makes me want to question that sentiment a little bit, that, that what theologically blobbed out in out-of-control ways that we didn't intend with that story, like a creeping mass of balloons out of control. It's, it's an ugly story, isn't it? Uh, one of the tribes of Israel is looking for a place to live, and they're in the promised land, the land that God promised. And so they find this 
valley. It's beautiful. It's rich. It's got good farmlands, good pasture land. Oh, and there's just one complication, right? It's not vacant. There are people who are living there. But it's supposed to be the Israelites' land. That's what God said, and that's what they believe, and so that settles it. And, and, and oh, by the way, the people there are peaceful. They have no weapons. They're not warlike. There's no army guarding them. So with the advice of a, of a priest who tells them that they have God's blessing, these Israelites go, and they butcher the villagers that live there, and they take it over. That settles it. Is that part of God's word? Now, look, I love my Bible, and there's wisdom in there. But is there a way to say no sometimes? And if we do say no, if we say, you know, some parts of the Bible, they maybe, you know, some parts of the Bible are sound teaching, and maybe some parts represent a moment in time or a context that we don't quite understand or, or a perspective, but, but not universal truth, then where do we draw the line? And, and who gets to draw the line? This is why the Bible gets so complicated, because of the way it's been used and, and very often misused over the years. You know, think of that story from Judges. You know, that story was a favorite of the United States Cavalry in the late 19th century as they were riding across the West, you know, taming the West, which is to say subjugating the West. Would hear that story and believe it. Or any other time, colonialists have come and taken over. But the same is true of slaves that might gather around in the barn of their plantation owner's or their, their owner's plantation and listen to a preacher preach from Ephesians 6 or Colossians 3 or a half dozen other places where it says, slaves obey your masters, serve them well. I mean, God said that, right? Does that settle it? Does it settle it that those same slaves would very often gather later in the day or all the more likely under the cover of night to listen to the story of the Hebrew people that Moses liberated and they cried out from their slavery and God heard their cries and freed them. So on the one hand, the Bible can be a, the crutch that buttresses injustice or it can be the story that sets you free. Well, what do we do with that? Do we let the big amorphous blob of teaching called the Bible wash over our lives like a balloon cloud in Cleveland bringing joy and pride to some of the people and, chirking, uh, and, and choking birds and drowning fishermen for others, making us feel God's love in one moment, but rationalizing slavery or the subjugation of women or genocide in the next. Even some of the clearest teaching isn't always so simple. Sometimes it's deceptively simple. One of my very favorite verses is 2 Timothy 3.16, which says, all scripture is, is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All scripture is God-breathed. I mean, that should be pretty simple. All scripture, not some scripture, but all scripture. But here's the question. Paul wrote that. What scripture was Paul talking about? Was he talking about the Bible, which wouldn't be fully formed for a thousand years? The 66 books of the Old and New Testament? Scriptures for Paul were the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Got the last two in the wrong order, sorry. But we treat it like it's speaking to a 21st century argument, and it's speaking to a 1st century argument about how Jewish and how Gentile the church should be. And Paul says, no, we come from Jewish roots. And here's the biggest question. When we succumb to God said it, I believe it, that settles it mentality, yes, our thinking suffers. From it and our theological notions, but more importantly, very often other people suffer. And very often those are the people that Jesus came to save who are the ones who succumb to it. Father Gregory Boyle founded Homeboy Ministries in Los Angeles uh, and, and uses that ministry to reach out to the gang population there in a redemptive way. And he writes, you know, for 35 years it's been the privilege of my life to walk with gang members in Los Angeles. At homeboy, at homeboy Industries, the work of accompanying the demonized to, so that the demonizing will stop is a gift beyond my ability to describe. I got a text yesterday from a homie who
who has struggled mightily with trauma and mental health issues. He wrote, he wrote, I can't decide if I'm good or bad. And I found myself telling him, you are unshakably good. You are my son. You just need to heal some things. There are good theological notions of God and sin that have failed us and left us malnourished. We have allowed the wounded to see themselves as less than. The proliferating messages of modern Christianity have not given us real tools or real food, but have left us feeling as I do when I catch a homie feeding his toddler flaming hot Cheetos, and I just want to say, dog, don't give your kids crap. The lens we use in our faith can't be a blind fidelity to everything we experience in our faith. Uh, we have to recognize that Jesus, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the, in the Gospels, Jesus never invites people to an unthinking or unreflective faith. In fact, usually his call is for unthinking people to think more deeply. Jesus builds people up, even when he challenges them, even when he calls them to account. His motive is always to build people up and not to destroy them. Jesus is the lens by which we should read the Bible. Jesus is what shows us, is who shows us what greatness and godliness even is, as the psalmist said. So God said it, I believe it, that settles it, is usually a way of us taking our own self-serving notions or something that's harmful or the thing which in and of itself probably seems wrong or absurd because but we embrace it because we want to embrace it, because it's what we selfishly want. And, then, and we can find a place where God technically said it. And so that's it. Well, Annie Dillard wrote that good theology removes absurdities. Have you ever noticed how good Jesus is at calling out the absurd? He challenges absurdity everywhere. He calls out favoritism among the Pharisees. He, calls out racism among his own disciples and other Jews. He calls out oppression among the Romans. And Jesus comes to show kindness and mercy to the victims of such absurdity. Jesus comes and stands with those who are living through sorrow and pain and struggle and poverty. Jesus shows us what God that is what is that, let me start over, I got tongue tied. Jesus shows us that part of what makes God great is that God is good. And if God were not good, he would be less great. I had a member of one of my congregations, and he would close every one of his Sunday school classes by telling the class, now y'all need to remember, God is just as good a Christian as you or I. I think that's true. So today, may you find that God is good. And in God's mercy, in God's kindness, God's longing for justice, God indeed is good. It is not just that God is powerful or, or creative or big that makes God great. God's goodness makes God great. God's goodness is not arbitrary. God's goodness is open and unfiltered, and it is what makes God great. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, the, the word heresy does not get bandied around church much anymore. It's old-fashioned. But help us to never buy into the heresy that you said it, so we have to believe it, and that settles it. Help us to be a questioning people. Help us to be a people who follow Jesus and follow his example and teaching. And help us to be people that hold everything up to the light of Jesus for confirmation and for living. Help us to be like Jesus in that way. Amen. Okay, so I have to confess, um, I sent the band their music this week, and I got my songs mixed up. So if it seems kind of like a Christmas song, just I know you, I just heard the sermon and, you know, be thinking people, blah, blah, blah. Just don't think about it. Just sing the song like it's not Christmas time, and it'll be okay. It's actually not an inappropriate song for today. But um, we, we're going to go to Bethlehem in it, but let's stand and sing it. Um, it's not like the first Noel or something, but let's stand and sing today as we close. We can remember Jesus every single day. It's That's all right. right.
the most beautiful night of the year. All the stars light up the sky, and the city is sparkling with silver and gold from a million points of light. A reflection of something that's deeper within, just a flicker of something more. so sorry we didn't sing that to candlelight it would have been so nice um go from this place knowing that yes god is great but god is good and god wants good for you and wants to invite you into a life of goodness and justice and and righteousness go forth to live that and go forth in peace amen <laughs>